Chapter 4 Introductions Entry 28 Homo Evolutus Humanus Defensor Adaptable Evolving Devoted Defenders Those are some of the few traits that apply to the majority of humans. All humans are substantially different from one another. Out of trillions of humans, none are really the same. While most of them share many similarities, they will always focus on their differences, going as far as to fight each other just because they don't like the same hyperball team or something silly like that. But in any case, once you add a common factor like, say, survival, they will set aside their differences, stick to each other like brothers, and face every challenge that may be waiting for them. Not that threatening the survival of any race wouldn't bring them together. It's just that humans have a different way of doing it. You see, during all their time on their home planet, they never went more than half a century without some sort of war sporting up. Most of them because of religion. Yes, religion. Who would have thought someone could make war out of that? But I am getting sidetracked. The point is, whatever they need to do, they will do it. That, my friends, is why they compose more than half of the USC's army in this day and age. They are more than willing to take the extra mile, and thanks to centuries of continuous conflict, they know what they are doing. Most of the time. Not to mention their species is the only one that can accept significant genetic treatment without horrible, horrible consequences. They possess full control over their genetic structure, and they can adapt to slightly different environments in a short lapse of time. When or if they decide to join the Colonial Guard, it is mandatory in most colonies. They must go through a gene-boosting procedure that upgrades their rather soft, squishy, metamelanian body into a taller, far more muscular version with greater bone density, and there you go. You have your average human. The truth is, the gene-boosting treatment has been passed down from generation to generation, and now, even without doing the procedure, the average human is considerably stronger than they used to be about 200 years ago. Yes, with today's technology, they could all, most likely, be turned into mutants with four arms that have chitinous plating rather than skin. But no worries, significant augmentation has been outlawed for far more than 100 years. Why do you think the human augmentation crisis happened? No need to have nightmares about evil men under your bed. Although they are now a primarily militaristic species, they have no real limitations as to what they can do with their lives. Humans are not bound by honor codes, as some species are, though that does not mean that they are barbarians. They are just, as I said, adaptable, flexible, or whatever term you would like to use. As one great Lacaron comedian once said, Qu'est-tu vor ec human ani? Avi rude kala even thur, masa akala ra er kuveku vimalan. Roughly translated as, I swear, these humans they can turn into anything. Soldiers, lawyers, strippers, whatever. Fragment of facts about the USC. All you've ever wanted to know, but mostly did not. Know about your government. Ebook by Lorak S. Lavakan, deceased. Rating 3.4. Error. Unable to download. A loud, high prayed scream swept across Sweet Apple Acres, interrupting the usual silence of the area and causing several birds to take flight. Next to a wooden farmhouse, three fillies and three bipedal creatures stood next to a pair of mares one of whom had started panicking at the sight of the foreign beings. The purple mare kept screaming while she struggled to stay away from Atlas to no avail. Behind her, Sweetie Belle, Apple Bloom, and Scootaloo were giving their best efforts to keep her in place. 
To their left, an orange man with a cowboy hat was staring at the three bipeds with wide eyes and a loose jaw. Ah, Twilight, ah, what are you doing? Apple Bloom said between grunts. They don't want to hurt you or anything, added Sweetie Belle, pushing her forehooves into the mare's back. Skooloo fluttered her wings, grimacing as the screaming mare kept pushing back. Taurus, guys, do something! Atlas, Taurus, and Max stood confused, while the purple mare, supposedly Twilight Sparkle, was desperately trying to get away from them. Her screams of fear could be heard through the entirety of the orchard, not doing any good for the three visitors. After shaking his head to clear his thoughts, Atlas knelt down to attempt to meet the mare to eye level, while resting on his elbows and knees. Wait, wait, he said, his voice sounding somewhat distorted due to the vocoder installed in his faceplate. We're not here to do you any harm. We just want to... Before Atlas could finish talking, the orange mare came back to her sensors and snatched Apple Bloom from the ground, grabbing her with her teeth. This caused the purple mare to stumble backwards, taking Sweetie Belle and Skooloo with her. They rolled through the dirt a couple of feet. They managed to get back on their hooves, but the purple mare took her place alongside the orange one with the fillies in front of them. Except for Apple Bloom, of course, who was being held by the orange mare. The mare with the hat placed the filly behind her and then turned back, taking a defensive stance. Girls, y'all gotta get out of here. Get away from those things, she yelled while pawing the ground, readying herself to charge the trio of bipeds. Apple Bloom walked up next to her. Applejack, they don't want to hurt you. They just want to talk is all. Yes, we just want to talk. That's all. We promise. Y'all got ten seconds to get out of my w- Wait. What, what the what now? The mare loosened up, looking more confused instead of angry. We just want to talk. Is that all right? Said Taurus. The two mares shared confused glances. The purple one opened her mouth a couple of times, her attempts to formulate words failing at first. Wh what J Just talk? She finally blurted it out. Atlas let out a deep sigh. Yes, just talk. Hiya! A raspy voice echoed from the distance. The whole group looked up towards the source of the cry. Atlas looked up just in time to catch a glimpse of the multicolored blur sent on a crash course for him. A net of bright blue hexagons formed around him, absorbing the force of the attack, then pushing the aggressor a good few feet away from him. Rainbow! The orange mare cried out. As it stopped moving, he realized it was actually a rainbow-maned pegasus mare. She flipped her wings and regained her balance, scowling at him. She growled and yelled out, Get away from my friends, you monsters! Wait, I'm sorry. Atlas was cut off as a pink pony dropped on top of him and wrapped her four legs around his head, obscuring his vision. Shortly afterwards, two more creatures clung to his legs, a white unicorn and a small reptile being. He frowned behind his faceplate and reached down, pinching the white pony and trying to pry her off his leg, while ignoring the other two creatures. Release me, you ruffian! The mare snarled wiggling her legs in the air as Atlas held her in front of himself. He reached up to his head with his other arm and tried to grab the pink pony, who squirmed and dodged out of his reach. Quick, every pony, run while you have them distracted! The pink mare exclaimed while avoiding the giant's hand. The rainbow mare shot off towards Taurus, who extended her metallic wings, lit up her suit's thrusters and flew upwards, barely avoiding the mare's attack. The two began a game of cat and mouse, while the mare repeatedly darted towards Taurus, who swiftly dodged every attempt against her. Every failed attack served to make the mare more and more infuriated. Mac, do something! Taurus yelled, before she noticed that the android was engaged in a staring contest with a yellow pegasus mare. Mac tilted his head from side to side, examining the mare. She stared back at him with a menacing glare, yet oddly looking disturbed at the same time. Would you please tell your friends that we just want to talk? He asked. She did not respond as the android kept observing her, not saying a word. He could literally see her body temperature rising, and both her breathing and cardiac rhythm increasing. She was either scared or about to attack him. Stop! Stop, stop, stop now! now! The orange and purple mare yelled simultaneously. The assault on Atlas ceased. The pink mare promptly hopped off him and onto the ground, followed by a dizzy lizard and a similar dizzy white mare with a ruffled purple mane. The pink mare shot an inquisitive look at Atlas, which he replied with an annoyed grunt. Taurus stopped mid-flight as the mare chasing her came to a halt. The mare gave Taurus an angry look as they both descended to the ground, and in return, Taurus folded both of her arms and huffed, holding her chin up. The yellow pegasus broke away from Max's stare and nervously backed away from him, 
hiding her face behind her mane and muttering under her breath, while the android simply continued to stare at her. Twilight closed her eyes and took a deep breath, calming herself down. She then opened them up and allowed herself a moment to get a good look at the creature that stood before her. His bright orange eye swept across Twilight and her friends, and soon was joined by his two companions, who walked over and stood next to them, flanking on each side. She wondered if her friend's actions had made them angry, and the thought alone sent a shiver crawling down her spine as her mind shuffled through several of the possible outcomes. The big one had summoned some sort of spell that hurled Rainbow Dash away with little to no effort in his part, seemingly without even noticing the attempted attack against him. At least it had made no real effort to fight against Pinkie Pie, Rarity, and Spike, instead of opting to groan and stay still after trying to shake them off. The more slender one had taken flight to avoid Rainbow Dash, using a rather interesting method. Fire. Blue fire. It had moved through the air with no problem, nay, graceful even. The silver one with blue eyes was arguably the most disturbing one. It had gotten caught up in Fluttershy's stare, yet had remained completely unfazed by it, even going as far to ask her questions such as, Are you okay? Another odd trait was its voice. It was unnatural, at least by equestrian standards. Perhaps it was a trait of its race. Twilight gulped. Please, uh, excuse my friends. She felt a shiver run down her spine as the eyes of the creature locked onto her. They must have thought you were trying to hurt us. She finished with a bashful grin and a giggle, and was relieved as the bigger creature nodded at her. All right. She took a deep breath. You want to talk? That's fine. But who are you? Or rather, what are you? And most importantly, why are you here? She asked, managing to maintain a degree of composure, despite feeling utterly terrified in the inside. Upon hearing her question, the bigger creature looked up and took a deep breath before returning his attention to her. We're travelers, it said through no visible mouth, its voice definitely male. Travelers from far away, and we happen to stumble upon your land. We don't mean to do any harm. In fact, we're just looking to strike up a conversation, you know, for the whole cultural exchange and such. But nobody in your village seemed really enthusiastic about it. They just seemed to be downright scared instead, though we honestly kind of expected that. Anyways... Apple Bloom and her friends were brave enough to open up and talk to us. Applejack scowled slightly and looked at Apple Bloom, who gave her an apologetic smile. The creature continued. She told us about a Twilight Sparkle. Supposedly, she's a leader figure of sorts, is well informed, and is very close with this princess of yours. Twilight beamed up. Oh, th that's me! She thought back to the mention of a cultural exchange and considered all the possibilities. I, I, I guess I can spare some time? But Twilight, said Pinky. The unicorn mare turned to the side of the rest of her friends, looking at her disapprovingly. She was not about to leave them, no. She would not dismiss the travelers either. She was not about to leave them, no, but she would not dismiss the travelers either. What if... can we take them to the barn with us? she asked. Applejack shrugged. Um, sure, as long as they don't cause any trouble. Wait, we don't have enough cake, especially not for that big one. He must eat tons, said Pinkie Pie, causing the slim, faceless creature to snicker. Twilight raised an eyebrow at the pink mare and looked at the creatures, gulping. Um, y you eat cake, right? Twilight asked. The large creatures nodded. Yes. Oh, and I know what you're thinking, and no. Though we're omnivorous, we won't eat you or anything like that. Cake sounds nice. Upon hearing this, the crowd of ponies gave several lax sighs. He then shrugged. Well, lead on. The whole group began to walk towards the dirt road leading to the barn, but after a few seconds they were abruptly stopped by Twilight. Oh, wait, I never actually gave you our names. Well, as you already know, I'm Twilight Sparkle, the town's librarian. She beamed up at them. Name's Applejack. Nice to meet y'all. Me and my family run this here farm, she said, tipping her hat. Rarity, my dear. Ponyville's fashionista. She struck a fashionable pose, which did not exactly cause the desired effect due to her mane being in a rather deplorable state, thanks to the big creature. Pinkie Pie began to hop around the trio of travelers. I'm Pinkie Pie, Ponyville's super duper most awesome party pony. I'm Fluttershy. Fluttershy's voice trailed off into a whisper as she nervously hid behind her mane. 
she's Fluttershy. She runs the animal shelter, and she's, well, shy. Twilight finished for her. The travelers nodded as each mares voiced their names and occupation. The winged one had to stifle a laugh on several occasions. Rainbow Dash leaped off the ground and flew a couple times around the group, then stopped and hovered face to face with a bigger creature, smirking. I'm Rainbow Dash. She switched positions, now directly in front of the winged one. The fastest flyer in all of Equestria. She placed extra emphasis on fastest and all. The slim creature chuckled. Call me Taurus. It, possibly a she, as hinted by the tone of its voice, folded its forelegs. And I think you're going to be in for a treat, it retorted, adding an indistinguished pinch of smugness to his statement, causing Rainbow Dash to glare at it defiantly. The rest of the mayor's of Phillies rolled their eyes. She was just being Rainbow Dash after all. Skulu, though, was too busy gaping at the two. You may refer to me as Mac, the silver one said, causing all of the mayor's eyes to turn to it, and Applejack lift an eyebrow. She chuckled softly at the coincidence. And I'm Atlas, said the big one. Nice to meet you, too. Okay, then, let's get going, said Twilight, her voice filled with excitement. The group got moving again, heading towards the barn. Twilight walked next to Atlas, careful not to get too close to him. Hey, um, could we maybe start that cultural exchange right now? She asked sheepishly, fighting hard to contain her inner scholar. She really wished she had a quill or a roll of paper right now at the moment. Atlas chuckled. <laughs> sure, ask away. Okay, she quickly went through her mental list of questions, and finally settled for the one that she thought was the best one to set a starting point with. Where are you from? We've never seen your kind around here, she said, letting some excitement slip into her voice. Uh, well... The bedroom of the Princess of the Night had always been a reflection of her eccentric personality. Blue walls lit by candles that shone with a similar glow, a product of magic, Luna's magic, that kept them lit. The ceiling was painted in the darkest of blacks, so dark in fact that it seemed to absorb the light around it. Encrusted into the ceiling were dozens, maybe even hundreds of tiny spots that, contrary to the rest of the room, shone with the brightest of whites, providing most of the illumination and resembling the night sky. Her chambers were also always kept tidy and neat. However, that was not the case at the moment. The room was littered with scrolls and tomes of all kinds, covering up a significant portion of the polished obsidian floor. In the middle of the bedroom was a circular bed with a blue alicorn sprawled on top of it. She remained motionless for a few more minutes. The only sign that she was even alive was the steady rise and fall of her chest. With a disgruntled groan, the princess got off the bed and made her way over to the nearby desk head hanging low. On the desk there were several books, ranging from ancient legends, prophecies, and the like, to even the most modern-day fairy tales in equestrian society. Some of the books were even so big and so ancient that they could have easily been as old as the princess herself, perhaps even older. Right on the desk were books that contained the information long forgotten by Equestria, books that were usually kept inside the vaults for tens or hundreds of years. Even so, no mention of the USS Vector could be found except for a book that depicted a vector as some sort of mathematical concept, but that was hardly relevant concerning the situation at Hoof. She sat down in front of the desk, levitating all the books into an orderly pile. She then began to do the same with several sketches and photos, all of them showing several skeletons, all of them laying on medical tables, and all of them from the same type of unknown creature. Sighing, she summoned her magic to pull open the drapes on the walls adjacent to her desk and look throughout a window that was shaped like the crescent moon. Canterlot was supposed to be bathed in sunlight, except for that Vector happened to be hovering right in front of the sun, making the city look dull and dark. Luna took a deep breath. Her eyes shifted to a bipedal doll clad in dinky pink armor, standing merrily on top of the desk. And just a few weeks ago, I was living the normal life of a princess. She grabbed the doll in her forehooves. Then all of a sudden, a thing crashes through the tower, and inside that thing, I find the remains of something, and a doll. Of course it had to be a doll. She looked at the doll, and it happily glanced back at her with fixed eyes and a smile. Her mind quickly flashed back to the image of the bloody doll it originally was, causing her to flinch. 
She had spent three hours frantically brushing her teeth after realizing she had actually carried it all the way over to Canterlot using them instead of her magic. She touched her lips with one of her forehoes and flinched, as her gums were still sore. Why do you resist my magic? She scowled, channeling her magic to control the doll. A blue aura enveloped it, and the doll slowly rose up into the air, reaching Lona's eye level before dropping back onto the desk. She sighed, rubbing her head. The doll simply repelled magic, and even Luna had a bit of trouble keeping hold of it. She had it tested for incantations, and found none. She was eventually forced to settle down and accept the fact that the doll was resistant to magic for some reason. Groaning, she levitated a few more sketches and photos in front of her. She shuffled through them and picked out one of the photos. It showed four skeletons lying on a surgical table. They belonged to the bipedal creatures Luna had seen three days earlier. Two of them had been significantly bigger than the others. Each of their bones were incredibly hard. The one next to them was slightly smaller, with less bone density than the last one. The last one was much, much smaller, most likely an infant. At the end of their four legs, they all had claw-like appendages that, according to the palace doctors, most likely had soft tips, indicating that the skeletons belonged to members of a highly dexterous species similar to minotaurs. But of course, she already knew most of that. After all, she had seen images of them from before they had died. She shook her head to clear her thoughts and placed the plush doll back on the desk. Okay, she sighed while levitating a quill and various pieces of paper. Let's do taxes. Twilight opened the door to the barn and trotted inside. Trailing behind her was Atlas and the rest of the group. I see. Well, I figured you already had something to do with the Vector. So, is it like a city then? She asked Atlas, who had to crouch through the barn doors, allowing the rest of the group to walk in. Not exactly, he responded. A large table suited for several ponies stood in the middle of the barn. On top of it were seven dishes with half-eaten pieces of cake, and in the center, a large cake with various apple treats. The entire barn was covered in streamers and a large banner that hung from the ceiling that said, Best Friends Forever. An awkward silence took over. The six mares and the single dragon walked over to the table and sat down in wooden chairs that were placed next to it, following suit the three humans, as they referred to themselves, and the crusaders, who never seemed to stop giggling and exchanging whispers. The silence was broken by a loud crash, and every pony turned to look at Atlas, who was sitting in what used to be a chair, but was now a pile of splinters underneath him. Sitting on the other side of the table, Taurus began snickering, and then broke out into a laugh, followed by the crusaders and Pinkie Pie. Uh, I I'm sorry, said Atlas. Ah, don't you worry none, Applejack waved a hoof dismissively. It was gonna break sometime soon anyways. Twilight sat down next to him and perked up. So, what is the vector exactly? she asked, barely able to contain her excitement. He took some time to pull some of the remains of the chair from under him before speaking up. It's... he trailed off, looking at the ponies. Taurus groaned and folded her to her arms. Just tell him already. Fine, he sighed, and looked back at Twilight. It's a ship. The Vector's a ship, he said. Instantly, the eyes of all the ponies locked onto him, their expressions showing total confusion. Twilight tilted her head to the side and raised one of her eyebrows. Like, an enormous airship? Yeah. It's not that kind of ship, it's a spaceship. The ponies grew even more confused, some of them even letting out a, huh? And leaning in closer, as if they were unsure of what they just heard. We are here on the behalf of the interstellar organization called the USC. It stands for United System and Colonies. The Vector is a spaceship. Think of it as a ship that, well, is able to fly through space. We... He gestured to his friends. Our humans. Though the USC is home to many of the species, we happened to stumble across your planet and, well, decided to drop by. The barn was taken over by a cold silence as the ponies processed what they had just heard. Atlas and his companion exchanged glances, unsure what to do next. So, you came from outside the Earth? How is that even possible? 
Rambodash asked, looking at them with wide eyes. Earth. I, uh... There's a lot of things your race has yet to discover, it seems, Taurus said. Twilight looked up and down at Atlas. I, I, I see. Let's continue with some more simple questions then, shall we? First of all, how do you breathe? I don't see any mouth or anything. Actually, do you breathe at all? Huh? Oh. Atlas tapped his face. This is a faceplate. It's part of our armor. He looked at Taurus. Masks off? He asked her. She gave him a nod. Sure, masks off. Instantly, a stream of gas shot up from their heads, and they began to take off their so-called faceplates. The mares and fillies all prepared for the worst, bracing themselves for alien eyes that were beyond the masks, and sharp fangs and green, slimy skin. The eyes, the mouth, the eyebrows. The ponies breathed a sigh of relief. The humans didn't look all that alien. They were just a little odd. Their faces were not so different from the face of a pony. They did not have fur covering their skin except for their eyebrows. Their eyes were smaller compared to those of a pony, but they still had the same structure. They had small bulges on the center of their face, which they could only assume were their noses. Atlas's features were more defined, as it would be expected from a male. His eyes were green. He had a stubble beard and a short cropped mane, though most of it was hidden away by his helmet. Taurus, on the other hand, had a much more feminine facial structure. Her skin was a bit darker than Atlas, her eyes were brown, and she had a long mane that was held back in a ponytail. Y'all don't look so bad, Applejack said. The man chuckled. Huh, thanks. Twilight perked up again. Uh, oh my, and you... She began to squeal like a little filly out of excitement. Atlas smiled and opened his mouth to say something. He quickly closed it and gazed down to look at nowhere. He nodded. Yes, sir, he said to no one in particular. Understood. Excuse me, but who are you talking to? Rarity asked. Atlas looked up. Huh? Oh, uh, no one. Don't worry about it. Say, Twilight, how close to the princess are you? She beamed up at him. Well, I'm a personal protege, she smiled, her face taking on a shade of crimson. Right, he said. Would you be so kind to set up a meeting for us with your princess? Do you have a way to contact her? Her smile intensified. Y yes, I, I mean, th let me ask her first. Spike! Twilight called, her eyes glistening. Spike rushed to her side and stood to her attention. Yeah, Twilight? Go fetch my saddlebags! Luna sat quietly in front of her desk while she did some paperwork. A doll and a large sack of papers were lying on top of the desk. The princess opened her mouth and gave a yawn that almost shook the roof. She allowed her head to rest on the desk and closed her eyes, letting the quill she was levitating fall onto the glossy surface of the desk. A loud knock on her chamber door snapped her out of her peace. Who dares to interrupt a royal rest, she thought. Princess Luna, gave a gruff voice, most likely one of the guards. Yes, she groaned. Princess Celestia requests your presence in her chambers. She said it was of the utmost importance. Luna let out a deep sigh. All right, all right, I'll be there soon. The princess stood up, stretching all of her limbs, some of her joints popping, and then slowly made her way over to the door, opening it with her magic. Outside, she met one of Celestia's guards. She was clad in shiny golden armor and had a retractable lance strapped to his shoulder. She began to walk through the castle's hallways towards her sister's bedroom, the guard walking alongside her. Midway through the hallway, Luna cast a glance through the multiple windows of the castle, some of which had not yet been replaced ever since the floating contraption made its appearance. Vector still hadn't moved a single inch. It was obscuring Celestia's sun, which had turned it into a massive highlighted shape. Almost like an eclipse, really, Luna thought. It's just missing the moon. The princess and the guard reached the door to Celestia's room. Luna gingerly opened the door with her magic and trotted in, leaving the guard in the hallway. Inside, Celestia was sitting on her cushion near the fireplace, sipping a cup of tea. All around her were several stacks of papers and new folders of some books. She looked over to where Luna was standing. 
Ah, Luna, I'm glad you came. Please, take a seat, she said, smiling. Luna trotted over to the fireplace and sat on one of its many cushions. The guard said it was of the utmost importance for me to come here. Did something happen? Ah, yes. Celestia levitated the scroll over to her sister. Please, read this. Luna took a look at the scroll with her magic and unrolled it in front for herself. Dear Princess Celestia, I have discovered the mystery behind the vector. It turns out it's actually a ship. A starship. And it belongs to an interstellar organization called the USC, which stands for United Systems and Colonies. Not too long ago, me and my friends were visited by three representatives from the ship. They would prefer to call themselves humans, though, according to them, there are many more species within the USC. Can you believe it? They come from outside the planet! And they say that stars are actually other suns, and that they're very far away. So far they have been, for a lack of a better term, nice, and have agreed to stay with us for the moment. I can't wait to hear about their culture. They have claimed they want to schedule a meeting with you. Today, preferably, according to them. I wish I could explain more, but I don't think the scroll is big enough. I'm so very sorry that I have to trouble you with this, especially in times like this. I understand if you do not answer my letter right away. Your faithful student, Twilight Sparkle.